Hello everyone, welcome back to the course, and in this lecture we're going to be talking about working with Phosphorus using Scratch 3.0. I want to talk about Phosphorus, um, you know, it's not something we've talked about yet, and it's not something I see people talking a lot about in Scratch courses in general, and it's something I find to be really important, and rather than it just be something you pick up on, I want it to be something that's actually thoroughly explained, not just how, what it is, but how it works as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and get into it, I'm going to go to the My Stuff folder, top right of the screen. Um, of course, we can also click this little button right here. Um, anyways, so what uh, what Phosphorus does whenever we share a project, and of course these are shared, we put them in the studio, right, um, that you guys have access to where you can see all the projects I've done throughout this course, right? Um, and so basically, whenever you share a project, your project actually gets a link. Um, and without that link, you can't use Phosphorus. So this doesn't work with unshared projects. I'll explain, but I'm just going to make a quick project. I'm going to share it. I'm going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of using Phosphorus um, and why it's good for larger projects and more advanced projects as well, uh, which you might want to start getting into doing, um, especially if you start applying a lot of what we've learned throughout this course. We've been practicing outside of the course, things like that. Um, you know, it's good to just start to scale your projects and scale your knowledge and of course do things that's within your comfort zone and things that you're uh, comfortable with doing um, and things that you're able to you know, program, execute and understand the code because anyone can just throw together an advanced project but not really know what they're doing like they could just be copying the code or things like that um, but you know I mean if you guys are actually making more advanced projects from scratch um, this is something you're definitely going to want to know about um, so I'm just going to go ahead and say um, phosphorus example. All right. Um, and then once I've done this, I'm just going to go ahead and make a project. It can be any project. Um, I'll just go ahead and do something that I know is going to be, um, kind of laggy is the word. So it's going to be not, uh, it's going to not run super smoothly within scratch. This is fine. That happens with projects, especially larger projects sometimes. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to do, uh, what, do, what do I want to do? What's just a simple game that takes up a lot of memory on your computer. Let's see. Um, I'm just going to try and get some inspiration from these sprites real quick. Um, I'm thinking something to do with a ball. Maybe like bouncing a ball around. I don't know. Like the ball makes clones of itself. Bounces around. We'll just do that. We'll make a basketball. It, again, it's going to be a simple project. We'll just make a basketball. Um, we'll have it go ahead and, uh, you know, when clicked, we're going to go ahead and set the, uh, we're going to set the rotation style to all around. Uh, as it is by default, but I just like to do that. Um, <clears throat> and so point toward, it's a good habit to get into. Um, we're going to go ahead and go to point in 90 uh, by default. And then I want to go ahead and point in, uh, uh, for once we've done that, forever point in, uh, pick random one to 360. Uh, and then also we're going to go when clicked. Oh, no, you know what we'll do? Th this will this will lag the project up a little bit. Uh, here's what we can do. We can go ahead and create a clone. And when we start as a clone, all right, um, we can go ahead and set the color effect to zero. We'll do that for actually both of these, as you'll see why. Uh, what I want to do is I want to set the color after that uh, anywhere from like 1 to 125. I don't know, something like that. We'll just go 1 to 250. Like we will just do that. Um, <clears throat> so we'll do this. And... Uh, Something like this. Yeah. Oh, I did not mean to do that. Control Z. I'm gonna undo. I accidentally just kind of threw that over there, didn't I? Um. So uh, we got our forever loop here. I got it under my set color function. Uh, in here, I'm gonna go ahead and make it move. So I'm just gonna go ahead and go move ten steps. Uh, I don't know. Something like this. Let's just see what this does. So this is just complete chaos. Um. Let's make it even more laggy, just so we can kind of demonstrate what this does even further. Um, real quickly, I'm just going to do the same script I did for my initial ball. Just increase randomness. Oh, that's not going to work. Oh, yeah, that's not going to work because um, it's constantly changing the direction it's moving. All right. Um, oh, what did I do? I want to do this. Okay, wow. That completely sprayed. <laughs> An array of vaults, didn't it? Um, oh, what if we did this? Okay, so there is a limit to how many clones, and they're always changing the limits, so I'm not sure how much it is. As I'm making this, you can find the most updated information on the Scratch Wiki, but I wanted to eventually delete the clone because of that. Um, 
oh, and then also one more thing, one more thing. Um, if on edge bounce, this way it's just gonna be like bouncing like crazy. It's just gonna be madness. Um, in fact, what we can do is uh, go ahead and make it change color effect by one. Yeah, I'm already I'm already sensing the lag. Yep, it just froze for a frame there. Uh, I'm gonna make the backdrop a uh, nice little gradient, perhaps. I don't know, um, something like this, something with fairly good contrast with all these neon balls bouncing around. Uh, how would this look? Nah, I think I'll do gray for the bottom actually. Something like that. Okay, so now we have this absolute chaos going on. Um, <clears throat> so let's go ahead and do the same for like all these other sprites as well. All right. Um, still not as much lag as I'd like. I'm just gonna double what I have. All right, this is a, uh, this should be good. I apologize if it's a little bit hard on the eyes. My monitor's toned down a little bit, uh, like my screen for my computer, but um, I apologize if it's a little bit hard on the eyes. But anyways, I'll just stop this project now, actually. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and see the project page. I'm just gonna go ahead and say instructions, watch, um, watch the basketballs go crazy. But don't freeze up your monitor in the process. Uh, notes and credits. Uh, I'll just go ahead and say develop by. I usually do something like this. Just develop by. If you notice, develop by. Um, what do I do? Udemy scratch course. For the date, I'm just going to do today's day, which is November 14th, 2019. Okay. So, something like this. Um... And what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and share this. All right, so now that this has been shared, I'm going to go ahead and actually go ahead and zoom out out of full screen for you guys real quick so I can show you guys my tabs and show you something called Phosphorus. I'm going to go ahead and go F11. In my case, I'm on Google Chrome. I already have it pulled up on this other tab here. I'll show you the link. It's also attached as a resource to the lecture. Um, but here we go. It's Phosphorus, and the link is phosphorus.github.io. It's safe and reliable site. Of course, GitHub is also trusted and well-known, millions of users, but Phosphorus, subdomain right here, uh, it's actually a project, open source, where it runs your Scratch projects really fast by compiling them to JavaScript. And so JavaScript is a text-based programming languages. And so what it does is it takes your block-based program and it converts it to text-based programming so that it can run faster and smoother. So what it does, essentially, it just uh, compiles it so that you can uh, you can run it in your browser or you can embed it into your own web page and things like that. Um, <clears throat> and so there's all sorts of things you can do with this. And uh, a very active community. They're constantly working on it, pushing out updates, things like that. Uh, it's also very commonly used. Uh, and for very advanced projects like 3D, advanced 3D renders, things like that. We already worked with some 3D animation, 3D development, stuff like that. Um, it's very useful. It can help your projects run a lot better because JavaScript, it's just faster than the browser-based Scratch. It just is at the end of the day. Uh, and that's why it's good to venture in the text-based programming once you've learned all these universal concepts from block-based programming. That's kind of the model, education model for programming I'm a fan of personally. But anyways, without further ado, I'm gonna show you guys what to do. So the URL here is what we call this, by the way, this link um, for our project page. Uh, it'll be scratch.mit.edu slash project and there'll be an eight digit number. Well, actually the length depends on I guess in my case it's nine, it depends sometimes, but anyways, that's not the point. Point is you got to copy this number, uh, control C, and this is basically the identification for your project so it knows where to go. So whenever you enter in this link, it goes to your project. Again, this can only be on shared projects. So you have an unshared project, it's not going to pick it up, and you can't really do it. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and just paste it in. I'm going to go control V. Uh, you know, I can also go ahead and right click and then paste. Um, and of course, you actually have to wait some time um, until like, so, so basically, you share your project, but there's some stuff that's going on in the back of the Scratch's servers, and it takes some time to actually let it work on Phosphorus. I'm not sure if mine works or not, but I'm just going to show you what this does. Um, sometimes you can have to wait upwards of an hour, just the way it is. It's a little bit weird. Um, 
But anyways, it's not something Foster seems to be in control of if you look at their code actually. Uh, they have the source code available here on GitHub if you want to look at that. If you're into JavaScript, if you've if you're into that already, which is pretty cool. Um, they have the credits here, they have reported problem. This is, you know, it's of course still in development, it's an ongoing project. You can always report bugs you see. I've as you can see, this link's been clicked before. Um, and of course, embed this project. So what this means, I'm just gonna go over this first. Um, if let's say you had a snake game, you know, the arcade classic snake where you have to eat apples to grow the length of your tail um and so let's say you had that and you had a web page and i don't know maybe, maybe it was snake.com i don't know i'm just making things up here uh and you wanted to put snake on your website but you're not fully familiar with text-based programming yet but you can do block-based programming you can do scratch and you want to get that project on your page it could be even like a song or an animation that you want to put on your web page you can embed it into your web page by compiling it with phosphorus, just enter in the numbers. And if you're familiar with web development, you know that you can embed code onto your web page. And so you can just copy this, you know, control C, or again, copy. Um, and basically this will embed the JavaScript for your program into your web page so that you can go ahead and run Snake, for example, in your web page. It's pretty cool. Uh, of course, you can hide uh, user interface. That'd be like these things, this full screen, this little toolbar at the top. You can go ahead and go light controls. Um, I'm actually not sure what that does, but that's a new feature. Uh, the start automatically basically means as soon as the page is loaded, it starts the project. Otherwise, you can manually start it by clicking a green flag or something of that nature. Um, and so what this is, uh, the most commonly used one is just package this project. It'll get a link to a web page that automatically runs it. Uh, and you can go ahead and go full screen or turbo mode. Uh, and that's really all it is. It just goes ahead and packages that up into JavaScript and runs it, except for it runs it faster. And it'll just notice less lag. And... So, I'm not seeing a whole lot of lag, and honestly, it would take, I mean, it's on and off for this project, but I wanted to give an example of something that's more, like, a lot of lag, but it's kind of hard to do a lot of lag in a short amount of time, and I want to keep this lecture short and simple, just so you guys have the option to work with this, if you choose to, if you want to go further in Scratch, and so I'm not going to spend, like, two hours on this. Uh, of course, if you guys want to know more about this, I can always expand, uh, as always, um, maybe add some more lectures, but anyways. Uh, so that's phosphorus for you. Very commonly used. Sometimes people just link in the instructions or in the notes and credits here, the link to the phosphorus version of their project, or a link to a web page where it's just embedded in uh, into the page, things like that. But uh, nonetheless, I hope you guys enjoy this lecture and learn something, and hopefully you guys find phosphorus useful at some point, should you choose to continue in Scratch. Um, that's all I had, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next lecture where we talk about transitioning to text-based programming altogether.